Uh, we all know Dr. Lebo very well. He's professor and chair of the Department of Dermatology at the Icon School of Medicine. He's author of over 500 publications. Uh, he's done so much for the field. He's now you know, president of the American Academy of Dermatology. And his expertise really has been in clinical trials in inflammatory skin disease, particularly psoriasis. And uh, the clinical trials that have been at Mount Sinai have really been uh, formative in the development of new therapy that really has done a lot for this disease. And I think really Mark has uh, been the uh, main person that uh, is involved in those therapies and has really done a lot for the disease psoriasis. And he's going to be talking about uh, mechanisms of inflammatory skin disease. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. It's been a privilege to work with uh, our DermPath team, uh, who have really, uh, I think when I started, uh, we had about uh, 1,000 or 2,000 specimens a year, and, uh, uh, and that has uh, grown to 80,000 or so. So we've really uh, done, you know, done, a, done a great job with it. Um, OK, so I'm going to give you an overview of uh, advances in uh, inflammatory skin diseases. Uh, that have taken place since literally before I'm in dermatology. I, uh, uh, I um, uh, don't get any uh, money myself from pharmaceutical companies, but our department does get a lot of dollars because of the clinical trials that we do. Um, so this is a uh, picture of Mount Sinai, and uh, the place where I see my patients and do most of my work is over here, uh, and this is the view from my window. So... Uh, Okay, this is a, uh, a beautiful model of the pathogenesis psoriasis that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine six years ago. And, uh, uh, and you can see it's a rather complex interaction of the immune system with the skin. Uh, and uh, when I first started in dermatology, we thought that psoriasis was a disease of the keratinocyte. Uh, and uh, some really superb scientists um, reported on uh, abnormal cell proliferation, and, and the mantra was that the cells of the epidermis normally make themselves over every 30 days, uh, and in psoriasis, it's every two to four days. So that histologically, what you see in normal skin, here's your epidermis, and this is psoriasis. You see the, this you know, massive thickening uh, uh, of the epidermis and the stratum corneum. Uh, 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 caused by those rapidly proliferating cells. Uh, and it wasn't until cyclosporin came around and was used in transplant patients that we realized it's not just the epidermis. Because cyclosporin doesn't do much to the epidermis, but it knocks out lymphocyte function. Uh, and so uh, this was the earliest report, 1988. And, um, and very quickly, uh, uh, we learned that cyclosporine is dramatically effective. So there must be something in the immune system that is contributing to psoriasis. Now, what does cyclosporine do? It knocks out the whole thing. Uh, that's why you get infections. That's why you get, that's why you get um, lymphomas. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so, of course, it works, but it has a lot of side effects. Now, um, one of the earliest uh, clues on uh, uh, that, that lymphocytes were involved and activation lymphocytes were involved came from um, a number of publications. Uh, actually, Jim Kruger contributed, and Alice Gottlieb, who spoke last night, the Greater New York Derm Society, contributed heavily to those. Um, and what happens in lymphocyte uh, uh, activation is um, uh, this is an antigen-presenting cell, uh, which is in the lymph node. Um, it, has a number, it has to go through a number of steps. And I actually think of these as keys on a door. So you have to unlock two of the locks in order to activate the T cell, in order to open that door. So the first step that happens is ICAM-1 on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell interacts with LFA-1 on a naive T cell. Uh, and in that interaction, um, it just hooks them, it lines them up together. Uh, the antigen-presenting cell then presents the antigen sitting on the major histocompatibility complex to a, uh, a T cell receptor uh, on the uh, surface of the T cell, um, and that's one of the locks. The second lock can be any of many different interactions. LFA3 and CD2, as you'll see in a minute, takes on importance because we did have a drug that blocked that. Um, again, ICAM1 and LFA1 can be another one of those locks as well. 
Um, so if you block any of those, um, you can prevent the next step that happens because when you do unlock those two locks, you get T cell activation, T cell proliferates, releases cytokines, uh, and uh, the next step is that the T cell, this now activated T cell, enters into the circulation and it tr goes through the circulation. How does it know to go to inflamed skin? Well, again, ICAM-1 is expressed on the surface of the endothelium uh, in inflamed skin, and LFA-1 lat helps that activated T cell latch onto ICAM-1, and then it diapodeses into the uh, inflamed skin. Uh, in that inflamed skin, it is then activated again by the same antigen. Uh, it goes through all the steps, and you get release of cytokines, TNF-alpha, and all of the steps that lead to proliferation of keratinocytes. Um, so the first drug that we had that blocked that was called the Lefacept. Uh, and what they did is they took LFA-1 and they put it on the, um, I'm sorry, LFA-3, and they put it on the um, FC domain of human, human IgG1. So they made a fusion protein. It was done genetically. And as you see here, LFA-3 and CD2 is one of those uh, key lock combinations, ligand and receptor combinations. Um, and simply by the size of the molecule, it separates the antigen-presenting cell from the T cell. The two can't interact. Uh, and so we had a, a drug that very specifically blocked T cell interaction um, uh, and, and worked for psoriasis. Unfortunately, it took lots of injections, and it took more than four months to see the peak effect, uh, and, and then ended up working in about a third of patients. So it was not a uh, huge success, and although it was a very safe treatment. Uh, ultimately, it did end up uh, getting taken off the market simply because it wasn't selling enough. Um, Efilizumab was another uh, drug that interacted with um, a couple of steps, and that uh, LFA, uh, Efilizumab, let me back up. Nope, okay. Here we go. Uh, Efilizumab uh, is a humanized monoclonal antibody to, to um, CD11A, which is on LFA1. So it's part of that interaction I mentioned several times. And so it blocks the LFA1 ICAM interaction in both places. Uh, it blocks the activation, and then it blocks the trafficking into inflamed skin. And interestingly, when we put patients on efilizumab, the angry lymphocytes stayed in the in the blood in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, blood, so that if you checked a CBC, you'd see lymphocyte counts of 20, 30,000, uh, because the lymphocytes couldn't leave; uh, they were stuck in the in the blood vessel. Um, and then, of course, it blocks the re reactivation as well. Um, and again, we uh, uh, that drug was on the market. And when those two drugs are on the market, uh, this is a, a slide I like to show because here were drugs that like worked okay. They were not great. They were nowhere near the efficacy of the drugs we have today, but they were much safer than methotrexate or cyclosporine. Uh, and uh, so I call this, this is the uh, drug companies dragging the dermatologist to the altar of uh, biologic therapy. And did it work? And the answer is even at that time when we had drugs that were frankly mediocre, um, when we started out, this is just when, when those drugs were approved. They only had 1% of the market. Methotrexate was 43%. Um, four years later, they had 56% of the market. Methotrexate was 23%. Now, by then, the TNF blockers had come out, and they were significantly more effective. Um, here are the TNF blockers, and uh, uh, there are actually five of them now. Um, infliximab, golinumab, and adalimumab are um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, etanercept is a fusion protein. Uh, and the uh, latest one, sertilizumab, is a pegylated. Uh, they, here they get rid of the FC portion of the human IgG, and they pegylate the FAB fragment. Um, you know, why can't you just put the FAB fragment in? Anyone know? It's very short-lived. Uh, if you just injected the FAB fragment, it would disappear in seconds. Uh, so, um, so they had to pegylate it, which uh, gives it a uh, long half-life. Um, so here's where the, t back to our original drawing, here's where the TNF blockers work. They block a lot less of the immune system. 
so they are certainly safer than methotrexate or cyclosporin, but they do block more than alefacept and efalizumab. And certainly with alefacept, we were not seeing opportunistic infections or any of the uh, consequences of immunosuppression that we see with cyclosporin or even methotrexate. Um, now here's how they work, uh, and this is uh, infliximab, and here you see it binding to both soluble TNF-alpha and to membrane-bound TNF-alpha, uh, and it is dramatically effective. This is actually the second patient with psoriasis ever treated with infliximab. It was a patient of ours, uh, that's before and after, a dramatic benefit. Um, uh, despite that, the uh, company that made it at the time, which was Centacor, didn't, uh, wouldn't give me any uh, to try, but Alice Gottlieb was more persistent than I, and she did get it, and it did work very well. Um, uh, dramatically effective uh, therapy. Um, here's, um, uh, so the, the next drug I'm going to talk about is ustekinumab. So uh, ustekinumab is an antibody directed against the P40 component of what was originally thought to be IL-12. So uh, the makers of ustekinumab thought that they were blocking IL-12. In fact, that P40 component is also an IL-23. So uh, the molecule, as it turns out, blocks both. And it turns out IL-23 is probably the key step. But here's where it works. So it blocks IL-12 and IL-23. So now we are much blocking much less than the TNF blockers. Uh, and so we have a molecule that at least theoretically should be safer, um, less immunosuppressive. Um, we should see fewer side effects. Uh, and dramatically effective. Uh, and uh, you know, until recently, the, the, the most effective drug we had for psoriasis um, here are some of the publications. Um, now, if you look over back at our drawing, IL-23 uh, uh, acts over here where it causes the Th7 T cell to create IL-17. And it turns out that that is a key step in the development of psoriasis. So ixekizumab and secukinumab block IL-17 directly. Uh, and then uh, brodalumab is a drug that blocks the receptor for IL-17, which is sitting on the surface of the keratinocyte. Um, here's the papers for the secukinumab trials, uh, ixekizumab and bradalumab. Um, and here's what we can do with those drugs. And this is actually a av very average response to those drugs. Here's a patient with psoriasis, 28-year-old patient. And this is four weeks later. So it's a profoundly effective therapy. Uh, now, until now, I've only spoken about psoriasis. Uh, the same map that I showed you in the New England Journal of Medicine for psoriasis was uh, uh, created by Emma Gutman, who's done a lot of the work in atopic dermatitis. Um, and so you see a different soup of cytokines leading to the changes that lead to spongiosis and all the consequences of, um, of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and eczema. Uh, this is a patient before and after cyclosporin. This patient actually ultimately went on to commit suicide uh, because of his eczema. We couldn't keep him on the cyclosporin because of its renal effects, uh, and he actually ended up committing suicide. It's a terrible disease. Um, so um, back to our drawing. Um, here's how cyclosporin works. It blocks the whole thing. It blocks all lymphocyte function. This is a child. And you can see dramatic before and after on cyclosporin, uh, but he does not like the blood, blood checks. He needs all the time for that. And here's a list of the side, side effects. Now, on this list are, um, I don't even list inf uh, opportunistic infection, which is a real side effect of cyclosporin. Lymphoproliferative disease, though, is the one that gets a lot of attention. And as you know, there's a huge increase in lymphomas, about more than tenfold, uh, and a huge increase in squamous cell carcinoma than skin. In fact, transplant patients on cyclosporin, uh, after 10 to 20 years, more than 50% get squamous cells. Uh, the leading cause of death in Queensland, Australia, among kidney, kidney transplant patients is metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. So uh, real side effect of cyclosporin. The two side effects that we worry about acutely are its effect on the kidneys, uh, which is why the package, the, uh, both the package insert and the guidelines say that patients should not be on this drug for more than a year. Uh, and I, 
will say that it's not like you know six months off or or eleven months off and then you give yourself a break and you go back on. You're knocking off nephrons, so you get glomerulosclerosis. So so if you're on it for you know six months, six months off, six months on, six months off, that you're still knocking off those nephrons. You're reducing renal function. Having said that, the guidelines also say that uh, under circumstances there are patients who you simply can't get off the drug and certainly. Before we had one of the drugs that we can credit Emma's work for, um, I had a large number of patients on cyclosporin for atopic dermatitis chronically. They'd been on for years, and you know I had the conversation with them over and over again. We kept a close eye on their serum creatinines. Um, but uh, fortunately, today, none of them are, are on cyclosporin because they're all in our trials, and they're all clear. Uh, so... Um, Everybody always gets excited. They see sexual frenzy on that list. Give me the cyclosporin. <laughs> uh, only been reported in Michigan. All right. Um, so along comes, uh, Emma demonstrates that IL-4 and IL-13 have a critical place in the development of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and dupilumab is uh, sitting on the shelf of a drug company, uh, not having anything to do. Uh, and... Um, uh, and it's an antibody to IL-4, they thought, uh, uh, very much like the ustekinumab story. Uh, and uh, so um, they uh, did test it. Uh, we actually were uh, uh, the first site, well, certainly one of the first, if not the first site, to test it a number of years ago. And um, uh, there's IL-4 blocking not only, there's the uh, antibody to that blocking not only IL-4, but it turns out it shares a receptor with IL-13. Uh, and so um, uh, it's, it shares a, a ligand with, with IL-14, with IL, I'm sorry, with IL-13. So there you see uh, it blocking both cytokines. Um, and here was this study. And I, I still remember the first patient um, at the lowest dose, because this was a dose escalating trial, with the first injection was dramatically better. It was a, just a, a miracle. I uh, never seen anything like it. Um, uh, so the study was dupilumab with topical corticosteroids compared to placebo with topical corticosteroids. The uh, um, this is the study design. It was given by sub Q injection weekly for four weeks. Um, the endpoints were the easy fifty uh, IgA of less than one and a scoride. Um, in terms of side effects, you'll notice that there were more side effects in the placebo group than in the dupilumab group, um, a really benign drug. Uh, and when do you do a study where 100% of patients with atopic dermatitis achieve an easy 50? Uh, well, that's what happened here. Uh, and it happened to every one of my patients. Every patient I put in the trial got better. Um, the, so, and you see it did the same with the SCORAD, easy scores. Um, paritis scores uh, to dramatically effective treatment. Um, here are the uh, IgA scores as well. And you see that the use of topical corticosteroids um, is dramatically less in the dupilumab group than in the, uh, in the placebo group. Um, so at the, you know, at the end of that uh, first trial, the drug company must have figured out, well, if it works for eczema, it's going to work for asthma. Uh, and they ended the trial and went, uh, and they did uh, uh, pursue some trials in Europe at that time, and then right in, went right into asthma. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, and undoubtedly we will be seeing this because it was profoundly effective for asthma as well, which when you think about it, it is like eczema of the airways. Um, um, now, there are other cytokines on that map that Emma drew, uh, IL-31, um, has emerged as a key cytokine in pruritus, and that has also been tested. Uh, here's a phase one, again, single ascending dose study, um, and uh, uh, single injection, and there were no uh, adverse effects of note, and a dramatic impact on pruritus. Um, dramatic improvement in sleep, uh, dramatic reduction in the use of topical corticosteroids. So again, profoundly effective um, treatment uh, and uh, being pursued right now. Uh, IL-22 is another one that we tested at Mount Sinai, also from Emma's map. And uh, this is one of the early before and afters um, and another. Uh, and I actually don't know if those are from uh, 
dupilumab or, uh, or the anti-IL-22, but we've seen recently uh, pr dramatic improvement, much slower than with dupilumab, but dramatic improvement with IL-22 as well. Um, uh, this is one that we haven't done so well with, TSLP, um, which you think might work. Uh, and M has now um, uh, been able to phenotype the patients and identify many in which IL-17 is particularly effective and uh, um, has submitted uh, uh, reports of patients treated with uh, drugs that block either IL-23 or IL-17 and thus indirectly block IL-17 uh, and are able to reverse. Uh, and this is actually her case report. Uh, uh, have been, black, been able to reverse atopic dermatitis fairly profoundly and quickly. Um, so uh, you see that case report there. So as I give this talk, I always go back to efalizumab, which was a Genentech drug. Uh, and this was the announcement that came from uh, Genentech uh, when, sorry, uh, that came from Genentech when uh, there were three reports of multifocal, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a very rare, almost unheard of uh, viral infection, which only emerges, emerges in the setting of immunosuppression. So very clearly, uh, you know, it had to be out on the market for several years and used in thousands of patients before we realized this, and then it was taken off the market. So it's early in the life of these drugs, and uh, we're excited about them. Uh, we don't know what will be in five years, but we're certainly the... The, the future is promising. Uh, we do think we'll have safer treatments. If any of you do use biologics, I'm going to give a plug here for a registry, uh, which is called the Corona Registry. Um, uh, uh, and this is a registry that now the FDA, ha that many companies are uh, with new biologics are using uh, because the FDA has mandated that they have to minimize risk and come forward with a plan to follow patients long term so that we do know when rare side effects like that come up. Um, you know, so here's something where you actually get paid very well to do something that's good for society. Um, uh, it's called the Corona Registry. It's in partnership with the National Psoriasis Foundation. Uh, you get paid $400 for a first visit, $300 for follow-up visits, and your patients have to fill out a questionnaire that takes about 10 minutes. Um, so it's good for, uh, certainly good for uh, data collection on these patients, and you get compensated for it. And if you're interested, it's corona.org, or there's a phone number listed there. Thank you very much.